to its original biblical Jewish richness and power. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Jonathan Kahn. Thank you. And it is great to be here. And I have uh, limited time and I have a lot of pages, so I gotta go real quick. So let me just start right now. Father, that's a, you're a blessing, you're anointing. In my weakness, be strong and touch your people. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Daniel 5 King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. Well, Belshazzar was drinking his wine. He gave orders to bring in the gold and the silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple of Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God. And the king and his nobles, his wives, drank from them. And as they drank, they praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand of the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale. He was frightened. His legs began to shake. This message is on the handwriting on the wall. The nation of Israel was unique in the world that it was founded by God, consecrated to God from its inception. But the people of ancient Israel turned from God. They began driving him out of their lives, out of their culture. They called their sins good, and they called what was good evil. They promoted immorality, first subtly and then blatantly. In driving God out, they began worshiping the gods of the nations and the idols of the nations, and they lifted up their children as sacrifices on the altars of Baal and Moloch. And God sent prophets to them, warning them if they didn't turn back, he would judge them. Judgment would come, and he called them back, but they mocked the prophets. They hardened their hearts. And then God allowed a shaking to happen to the kingdom, a wake-up call. But that shaking did not bring them back to God. They became more and more defiant against God. And ultimately, they just, they, with their defiance, judgment would come. And they would be wiped off the face of the earth, the northern kingdom of Israel, 722 B.C. But there was another civilization also dedicated and consecrated from its inception to the will and the purposes and the glory of God. And that civilization is called America. From the earliest days of the Puritan, America was founded to be a vessel of God. It was even conceived after the pattern of ancient Israel. A man voyages across the Atlantic from the old world to the new, writes a message in which the first symbol of America appears. It is the city on the hill. The man is John Winthrop, leader of the Puritan Exodus. If the people, he writes, if the people of this new American civilization would follow God, then he wrote, the Lord will be our God and delight in all our ways and we shall see much more of his wisdom, his power, his goodness than we have formerly seen. We shall find the God of Israel is among us when ten of us shall be able to resist thousands of our enemies, he'll make us a praise and glory that men shall say of succeeding plantations, the Lord make it like that of New England, for we must consider that we shall be as a city on a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us. In other words, as much as America would follow God, it would become the most blessed civilization on earth. His words would come true. America became the most blessed, the most prosperous, the most powerful nation in the history of man. But there is a but. For the civilization that was patterned on ancient Israel has also followed the pattern of ancient Israel's fall and turning away from its God. As did ancient Israel, we have also driven God out of the culture out of our public square, out of our schools, out of our courts, out of the lives of our children. As did ancient Israel, we too have replaced God, the God of our foundation, with idols, serving pleasures, serving prophets. As did ancient Israel, we have promoted immorality. We've called our sin good and we've called good evil. And as did ancient Israel, we too have committed the sin of killing our most innocent. Israel sacrificed thousands, but we have sacrificed millions. Over 50 million unborn children, and our collective hands are covered with blood. Imagine a Christian retreat center where all the children every day are taught of the Word of God, 
where its closed circuit television system shows only that which is consistent with biblical values, where its newsletter every week prints up the words of sermons of the local pastors, where every night its television programming ends with a sermon. It would be a Christian retreat. But what I just described to you was not a Christian retreat. I described to you America. That was America of not too long ago. An entire nation where the children were taught the Word of God. Where its newspapers published sermons. Even the New York Times published sermons. Where every night its television programming ended with a sermon. What happened to that America? The same thing that happened to Israel, except on a greater scale, even more dramatically. The civilization that was founded to spread the gospel of God now fills the world with pornography. The school system founded to teach the scriptures now instructs children against the scriptures. The nation's supreme court that opens up God save this honorable court now strikes down the very ways of that God. If a nation should pass judgment on the ways of the Almighty, how will the Almighty not pass judgment on that nation? A civilization founded by God and now a president who can place his left hand on the word of God to assume his office and then with his right hand nullify the very word upon which he placed his hand. That is where we have come. Imagine somebody from the 1950s turning on their television set and seeing Leave it to Beaver. But instead comes on the television screen what's on television today. What would they think? They would think it was the apocalypse. Has the handwriting appeared on the wall? People quote the city on the hill, but what they forget is there was one more quote to that. On the other side of the promise, John Winthrop went on. He said, but, but, if our hearts shall turn away, that we will not obey, but shall be seduced and worship other gods, our pleasures and our prophets, and serve them, is propounded to us this day that we shall surely perish out of the good land where we are going. In other words, if we turn against God, instead of our blessings, the blessings of Israel will come the judgments of Israel. For those of you who have read the Harbinger, what it is of the biblical warnings that were given to Israel, nine signs that appeared before the end, they have appeared in America, they have continued. But even without knowing that, the overall template is of a nation that has known God, turns from God. It is worn and grows, it grows worse if it does not turn back to God. Israel vowed in defiance against God. And, and no matter what they did, nothing would be right. And the same with America. There are many issues and many important issues. Not, and, but the ultimate issue is not economic or political or military. The ultimate issue is spiritual and moral. That is the ultimate issue we're dealing with. Everything else has a place. America's issue is God. And until that gets right, nothing else will be right. For those who have read the mystery of the Shemitah, even without getting into the details, the ultimate issue is this. A nation's blessings come from God. And a nation cannot drive out the God of its blessings and blaspheme him and expect those blessings to continue. I believe a great shaking is coming. The timing of that shaking, I've said from the beginning, we cannot get dogmatic. But we are heading to that. One of the things that was, for those who know who are focusing on a particular date, which I, say, I warn, do not focus on a date. But the, 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 the overall principle that was missed is the very template of the Shemitah has actually come to pass, which is about a long-term descent of the stock market, a long-term descent with crashes. That has already happened. It has already wiped out trillions of dollars. That's where we are now, regardless of what is yet to come. We have watched that happen, that we are in the midst of that right now. Where are we heading? The point is that God is sovereign. There is something in the harbinger called the mystery ground, and that bears mentioning now. When judgment came to Israel, the calamity returned to the very place where the nation had been dedicated and consecrated to God in prayer, the Temple Mount. On America's first day as a consecrated, fully, fully constituted nation, its first president, Washington, placed his hand on the Bible and was sworn into office. And that day, he gave a prophetic warning, which is this. He said, the propitious smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself has ordained. In other words, if America, America is blessed, it will be blessed by God. If it turns away from God, the blessings will be removed. He and the first nation then went, or the first government went on foot to dedicate America to God in prayer. And there they did. That ground is America's consecration ground. Where is it? America was dedicated to God on its first day on the place we call Ground Zero. The 
the calamity returned to the same spot as in ancient Israel. And that day a shockwave went forth and struck the very place where Washington gave the warning of what would happen if we ever turned away from God, put a crack in the foundation of America's foundation. That was, now we go back to Babylon. Pagan city, empire, head of empires. At the peak of its power, something happens. The king in his palace, in the middle of a feast, says, take those sacred vessels of God, of the God of Israel, and we will use it to party to our gods. And the moment that happens, the handwriting comes on the wall and says to them, judgment is coming. That very night, judgment came. And so, what is the principle? A biblical principle is here, very important. That before judgment comes, there is often an act of desecration. And to take the sacred vessels of God and turn them for an unsacred person, that, that's desecration. And you can find the pattern throughout Scripture. Ezekiel is taken to the temple and God says, look, what you, look, son of man, do you see what they're doing? They're worshiping idols in the temple, in the holy place. Then he speaks of judgment. Well, here we are in 2015 America, and the question is asked, has the handwriting appeared on the wall? The cups of Babylon, they, they were, these were sacred cups from Jerusalem turned away. But there's another sacred vessel of God. It is called marriage. Three months ago today, America crossed a line in the highest court of the land, overruled the rule of God, struck down the order that God ordained. If anything could constitute that of which Washington warned, a nation disregarding the eternal rules of order that heaven has ordained, it would be this. What happened then was tectonic, it was seismic, it's culture changing. It's bearing profound ramifications. It presented a decisive act against the word and the foundation of this nation. And the prophets cry out, those who call evil good will call good evil. And so the Supreme Court justices, actually those dissenting justices, they ruled. And the, the ones they said, they gave a warning, they said, this will lead to persecution, every single one of them. In the palace of, of Babylon, they took the vessels and they used them for desecration. Marriage was created by God. If you take that sacred vessel and you turn it against the purposes for which it was created, you are performing an act of desecration. To do that is to drink wine in Babylon from the cups of God. And if any act fulfilled that warning, it was that the smiles of heaven will be removed from the land. Another sacred vessel of God in the Bible is the rainbow. It belongs not to man or an organization, it belongs to God. To take that sign and use it to celebrate the other first desecration is a second desecration. And on the day that, that America struck that down and the, the rainbow was waved across the land, that night, as the night fell on this nation, the president ordered the White House to be lit up in the, not red, white, and blue, but in the colors of the rainbow. You can put that on if you have the image. The striking down, to celebrate the striking down of God's order. So now the White House became an, a vessel of desecration. That's a triple desecration. The highest house of the land, like the palace of Babylon, the handwriting appears on the wall, engraved in the colors of the rainbow. And what is the rainbow? It's a sign of covenant. What happens if you break this? It's you're saying, I'm breaking the covenant. The rainbow was a sign of God's mercy in the midst of judgment. What happens if you defy that? Here that has happened in America. Now the template of the harbinger of the judgment that came is that of nine signs that appear in the land. One of them is the, the sign of the tower that's, going, that's been going up at ground zero. It was a tower that actually the president wrote words on its very top which were words of defiance on top of that tower. Well, on the, right after this decision was made, that tower was lit up, the spire was also lit up in the colors of the rainbow. To say, you know, the color, you can see it there, the colors of the rainbow also are the colors of the throne of God. And saying, we will not be ruled by God, we will be ruled by our own will. And so here it is now. The, the scripture not only speaks of desecration, it speaks of abominations. And for three abominations, judgment came on the land of Israel. The first we've already spoken of. And that was immorality and the twisting of gender, the twisting of morality. We've passed the tipping point. The number two, the second abomination, it's written that God judged Israel for the sin of murdering its own children on the altars of Baal. And so here we have this, the second abomination was exposed even this summer. 
Not only have we murdered them, we have harvested them and trafficked in their murder for money, something that even ancient Israel never did. And if that's not an indictment of a civilization, nothing is. And that we cannot even stop ourselves from continuing to fund it. And the third abomination that brings judgment in the Bible. The Bible calls the gods and idols of the nations abomination. And the, when a nation drives out God, it's never neutral. It always brings in other gods. And, and so as we've driven God out, there have been idols. We don't call them idols. We don't call these things idols, but they are nevertheless idols. Could there have been a sign concerning this thing in the last days of Israel? The images of foreign gods appeared throughout the land. Well, I want to show you something that just appeared this August after the Supreme Court ruled in New York City. Show the image. That is, if you see it, that is the Empire State Building. On that, on the Empire State Building is the projection of a false and foreign god. It is the, probably the, the largest image of a false god in the history of man. That's the Hindu god Kali. And so the Bible says, woe to those who put light for darkness. You know they use thousands of lumens of light to light up this god. This god is the god of darkness. And here is, and here the, Kali is also the god of death and destruction here over New York City. We are racing. We are racing to judgment. And I believe a great shaking is coming. And I would add one other sign. When judgment came to Israel, the prophet Jeremiah was in prison. When you imprison the righteous, that is a sign. Well, this summer, America crossed another line and imprisoned a Christian woman for the crime of not being able to partake in what God calls an abomination. And not only that, but when they polled Americans as to what they thought about it, the overwhelming majority said that the woman should have been imprisoned for that. On the day that Solomon stood on the Temple Mount to dedicate the house of God. He prayed for Israel's future. He said, God, if they ever fall away, Lord, they, and you judge them, if they come back to you, Lord, if they seek you, have mercy on them. That night, God says to Solomon, Solomon, here's what I'll do. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways, I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Four decades ago, in the 1970s, America was at one of its lowest points. Spiritual, morality, everything low. Uh, economy in shambles. Inflation skyrocketing. Unemployment skyrocketing. America's waiting on line for oil. America's prestige around the world shattered. Its arch enemy, the Soviet Union, advancing in the world. And in Iran, 52 hostages. And every night on television, the crowds from Iran would say, death to America, death to America. It seemed as if the sun was setting on the American age. But there were a number of believers who said, we have to pray. We have to gather together. And we have to pray. And we're going to pray with a promise that God says, if my people repent, and we're going to come. So here, so believers from all over the nation converged on the capital city here. On the western, outside the western terrace of the capitol building on the Washington Mall. With a scripture, if my people, if my people will repent, will turn. And they joined hands and prayed for two major things. One, that where um, the American military was helpless right now, and America was helpless, God would set free the hostages by his hand. Number two, they put... put they pointed their hands to the capital and said, God, put in, put in leaders whom you will, who, will, who will do your purpose. Six months later, there was a revolution in the polls. Six months later, there was a, a new president swept into office who called America a city on a hill and who called for a prayer and spiritual revival. His name was Ronald Reagan. Along with him were swept multitudes of others who pledged to uphold biblical values. The inauguration is always held, was always held on the Eastern Terrace since the time of Andrew Jackson, but Reagan said, let's change it to the Western Terrace. So they changed it to the Western Terrace, overlooking the mall. So now he's sworn in on the very same place where they had the gathering of believers praying, if my people. On the very same, and he was standing on the very place to which they were pointing their hands, God, put in who you want. On the very hour of him being inaugurated, the 52 captives in Iran were set free. Two prayers that were prayed in the very place answered on the very same hour. History changed. From that time, America began to rebound, to resurge again. The economy, the military, the Soviet Union began to fall. It was called mourning in America. The very changing of history, and it began with one man's hand on the Bible. 
But even before that, it began with believers gathering together and praying for the Word of God. And yet there was even more to that. Because when Reagan was sworn in and history changed, his right hand was like that, but his left hand was on the Bible. And it wasn't just on the Bible, it was on a certain page and a verse that said, the verse was, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I'll hear from heaven, I'll heal their land. God was answering the prayers of his people. And you see, even bigger, you know, it's not that votes follow the election, the election can follow, or actually, or that prayers have to follow, elections can actually follow prayers. The hand of God is greater than all powers, than all problems. And now we stand at a moment even more critical than them. We have in America even more estranged from God. Is there any hope? Where there is God, there is hope. It seemed impossible then, it seems impossible now. But God still has the word, if my people. If my people. God is stronger. The answer is not going to come from the Supreme Court or the Capitol or the White House or Wall Street. The answer may involve all those things, but the answer is only going to come from the God of America's foundation. From the God of Winthrop, the God of Edwards, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's why you are so important. That's why you are, what you are here is so important. Because it doesn't take a nation, it, ta it, does, it takes a God and it takes a people. But a people who will be all out for him, who will cry out to him with all their hearts to, in prayer and supplication for revival on the land. And who will not rest until that comes. It will take a people who not only pray for revival, but who actually live in revival. A people who are engaged in the culture, who vote, but not only vote with their hands, but vote with their lives. It will take a people who put truth ahead of gain, integrity ahead of popularity, righteousness ahead of their own advantage, and the will of God over their own wants. It will take a people who will not compromise, who will not fear, who will not be shaken, who will not be intimidated, and who will not be silent. It will take a people who refuse to exchange what is true and right and eternal for the shifting winds of the judgments of man, but rise above them and hold to what is unchangeable, who will not bend the word of God to fit their will, but will bend their will to fit the word of God. It will take a people who refuse to bow down their knees to Baal, no matter what the cost, no matter what the odds, no matter what, what comes. In the day when the dark grows darker, it is time for the lights to grow brighter. You see, if the church of America had been the light to America it was supposed to be, it could never have gotten this dark. If it had been the salt to America it was supposed to be, it could never have gotten this rotten. We are now living in the days of Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Elijah. A prophetic day requires a prophetic people. The days of Elijah require us to be the Elijahs of this day. For it is written, the eyes of the Lord searched to and fro the entire earth, looking for the one whose heart is completely his, that he might show himself mighty for them. You be that one. You be that people. It's time to become single-minded, focused. It's time for the good to become great and the great to become mighty. And no matter how great the odds, no matter how imposing the opposition, no matter how formidable the challenge, if you stand for God, if you hold to what is true, if you fight the good fight, remember this, you are on the winning side. For our cause is true, our fight is good, our foundation is eternal, and our hope is in God. And in that we will not give up hope, that from this civilization called America, from this city on the hill, it will once more shine with the light of God, for whom she was called into existence, and who is her only glory, her only answer, and her only hope in the name of the God, above all gods, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Yeshua, Jesus, the only hope we have now and forever. Amen. Please.